Good evening, everyone. That was sort of anemic. This is a fabulous event, and, and so we need a little more enthusiasm, if you don't mind. Good evening. I like it. I like it. I'm Alan Leshner. I'm what's known as the former and now interim CEO of AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and I get the great pleasure of welcoming you all to the eighth annual Golden Goose Award ceremony. We at AAAS are tremendously proud to be one of the nine founding organizations that have now been joined by a very large number of partners and sponsors who are listed in your program, but this has really become an event since our friend, Congressman Jim Cooper, came up with the idea maybe nine years ago. I said earlier today that, in, in fact, for me, this is a personal, particular pleasure since I was at the National Science Foundation many years ago and had to defend NSF against the golden fleeces. And it accounts for the fact that I'm actually 27 years old and look like this because of that experience. But this really is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the tremendous benefits that have accrued from basic research, including basic research with totally unpredictable ultimate results and ultimate uses. The Golden Goose is about telling the stories of science. And one of the things we've learned in communicating both to the public but even to our colleagues in the scientific community is there's nothing better than a good story, and particularly a good story that has the productive endings that we've had from these kinds of research that we're honoring today. So we're very pleased to be with you. Uh, we're, I'm particularly pleased to welcome you, and I'm about to introduce our MC for this evening, the distinguished Emmy Award-winning journalist, who's also the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University, Frank Sesno. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan, very much, and thanks all of you for coming, and thank you for inviting me. I mean, this is the high point, this may be the high point of my year, here in Washington to come to a place where we know and respect and celebrate science and the discovery and the amazing curiosity of the, of the human species. This is the sixth time I've had the privilege to emcee this ceremony, and as I say, it is a high point. The Golden Goose uh, Award uh, celebrates silly sounding, I prefer the word serendipitous science that has returned serious benefits to society. I mean, imagine embarking on one mission and ending up someplace else and transforming humanity in the process, or what you stumble upon and how that can change people's lives. So tonight, we'll honor three teams of researchers whose federally funded work may have seemed silly at the time, odd or obscure, but thanks to serendipity, it made a significant impact. Now, nominations for the Golden Goose Award can come from anyone, that would be you, um, so if you have a story to tell, please share it at goldengooseaward.org. There's a lot of letters there, but I think they work. Uh, and nominations are evaluated by a distinguished panel of scientists and science professionals who comprise the Golden Goose Award Selection Committee. In addition to AAAS and the founding organizations listed in your program, the Golden Goose Award is supported by many other organizations and institutions, and without them we wouldn't be here. Uh, without their backing, the night, the award itself would not be possible. So I'd like to thank these sponsors whose support has made the 2019 awards possible and what the awards are. The Golden Goose Awards benefactor organization is Elsevier, which made a generous multi-year commitment in 2015. You'll hear from Elsevier a bit later in the program. This year's friend organization is United for Medical Research, and this year's contributor organizations are the American Mathematical Society, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Association of American Universities, 
Mattel, IEEE USA, and Sage Publishing. We also appreciate the support of our many supporter organizations listed in your program. Would you join me, please, in a round of applause for our program supporters? And I just want to, again, put a button on that. Thank you, thank you very much for supporting this to support and celebrate science and the contributions that science makes in so many ways. Now, this is worth noting in Washington. The Golden Goose Award has always had strong bipartisan support in Congress. Yes? Should I say that again? <laughs> strong bipartisan support. And I'd like the public and my friends in the media to note that there is something that has strong bipartisan support. We're pleased to have several congressional supporters here tonight, and I'll ask each of them to come up and say a few words. And I'd like to start with um, the newest Golden Goose congressional supporter. We're so happy to have on board. Very excited to have with us the co-founder of the bipartisan, again, bipartisan, that word comes back, Agriculture Research Caucus, Representative Rodney Davis, the great state of Illinois. Congressman, we welcome to you to the stage and to our gaggle of Golden Goose Award. First off, thank you very much, and I do want to give a special shout out to my colleague, Mr. Cooper, Jim Cooper, for coming up with this award. How many years ago? Eight or nine years ago, scientifically known as eight or nine years ago. Uh, listen, it takes leadership from folks like Jim and Suzanne Bonamici. Uh, they have a history of working in a bipartisan way over the last six and a half years that I've served in, in Congress with them. It's an honor to be able to be here. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. The last time I was on this stage a few months ago, uh, I was here to introduce some different songwriters from uh, different genres of music. And, you know, I got to thinking, about the scientific experiments they may have actually performed on themselves, may not have been NSF sanctioned at the time, but they were to be able to see the specialness of what investment in research means to our communities, especially the district that I serve. I'm even more humbled to be able to stand here today than introducing the last time Don Felder from the Eagles to uh, come on and sing Hotel California. And that's not just because of Jim, but he's a big part of it. He really is. The University of Illinois is Champaign-Urbana in my district. Just in 2014, we saw Dr. Larry Smarr uh, be a recipient of the Golden Goose Award for research on black hole collisions, which in turn spurred other federal supercomputing initiatives. And his project was funded through the NSF. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, get other people and other institutions thinking, but the University of Illinois uh, at one point recently was the largest recipient of National Science Foundation research dollars. Clearly, because it's my district, uh, secondly, because it was Jim's idea, and thirdly, because Suzanne, of course, wrote all the funding letters to help us, so thank you so much. Science matters, research matters, we will not be a better community, we will not be a better country, and frankly, we will not be a better Congress unless we all realize it. Thank you to my good colleagues and also to my friends who are not yet here, but Bill Foster, Elise Stefanik, Senator Coons, and my former colleague in the House, Senator Gardner. Thank you all very, very much. Well, thank you, Congressman. Now I'd like to invite on stage the Congresswoman from Oregon, who serves on the House committees that handle science, education, and climate. She also co-founded and co-chairs the Congressional STEAM Caucus, it's bringing together the arts and the sciences, in case there was any doubt as to what STEAM stood for. We're delighted to hear from her at our, uh, we were delighted to hear from her at our awardee luncheon, and we welcome her back on stage now, Representative Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you so much, Frank, and to everyone who's here today, Aaron, Alan from the AAAS, and, and especially to the awardees uh, and their family members, welcome. It's an honor to join you at another Golden Goose Award celebration where we're recognizing, as you heard, bipartisan support for federal research, which is so important. 
We know that we value the scientific discoveries, and here we're going to talk about how persistence and risk-taking and creativity led to scientific discoveries uh, that address complex problems, and that's a really good positive thing. So we're celebrating tonight, and I also want to thank Representative Cooper. I'm not afraid to say that sometimes he's known as Father Goose in this setting, who, who founded this wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, to highlight those discoveries that some might dismiss because of odd-sounding titles or labels. Non-scientists might not understand what those projects are about, so that's why we're here today. I had a chance to visit with some of the awardees this afternoon at lunch. I tell you, if you say to someone frog skin or thyroid cells or blood from horseshoe crabs, they might not necessarily think about life-saving research, but that's what this is about. And as we heard, as Frank said, science is often serendipitous. And these examples reaffirm how important it is to support researching the unexpected. Now, as a member of the Science Committee, I have long been a supporter of federal research, and I know that the federal government must be an active participant in funding basic research, even with, when, and especially when, the benefits are not known. And also, we must engage the scientific community in our decision making and use science to inform our policy. We need the expertise of science, scientists to solve the big problems and challenges ahead. So I serve also on the Education Committee, as you heard. And in my work on the Education Committee, we're always talking about uh, how do we educate the students today for the future, for the jobs of tomorrow. How are we going to get people to be those risk-taking, creative uh, people we need? Um, and that's through well-rounded education, and that's where STEAM comes in, this, the integrating arts and design into science, technology, engineering, and math. We just had a hearing in the Science Committee on Artificial Intelligence, and one of our great witnesses is a computer scientist and also a poet. So we know that STEAM educates both halves of the brain and leads to both well-rounded students, but also people who can more effectively communicate the work that they're working on. So science is unpredictable. These stories here that we're going to hear about today and learn more about show the value of persistence when the results are unknown at the outset and also the value of federal investment, which I know my, my great colleagues here will continue to support as well. So congratulations again to all the awardees. Thank you everyone for being here to, to uh, help us celebrate uh, the value of federal research. So thanks again, have a great time tonight. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. And I just want to double down on what you said about STEAM in both sides of the brain. So my daughter is studying marine biology at the University of Hawaii, and she's also an artist, and she takes what she discovers with sea urchins and studying how climate, uh, how uh, ocean acidification and warming affects her little sea urchin friends, and then she turns them into illustrations, and they have exhibits, and they get little kids coming in, and then they ask questions about it, and she brings all these kids into science through the imagination and the back door as well as the front door, and it's so great to see. I want to uh, invite now up Congress's, Congress's only PhD physicist. And if you think there's anything intimidating in introducing a congressional member who's a PhD physicist, this is it. He's a champion for sustained federal investment in scientific research, co-chairs the Inventions Caucus and the R&D Caucus. Thrilled to have him in Science's Corner. Please join me in welcoming Illinois Congressman Bill Foster. Well, thank you so much, but I'm afraid I have to start this out with a, with a correction. I am, in fact, no longer the only PhD scientist in the U.S. Congress. You know, one of, you know, one of the lessons in this job, I guess, is that you, you um, look for allies wherever you can find one. And so um, the other PhD scientists in the U.S. Congress is a Republican, a lifelong farmer from central Indiana who in his youth got a PhD in swine nutrition. All right, which is wonderful, you know. I, and he is actually, he's a wonderful, thoughtful guy, Jim Baird. And he, um, he and I are the co-chairs of the Research and Development Caucus together. And so it is just wonderful to see, you know, some progress because besides that, it's exhausting. Even, even if you're not working for NOAA, 
It is exhausting. <laughs> and just, and I want to thank you for being such strong allies. When we get exhausted, it is, um, it is necessary to have allies who really support science. And they come at you from all directions. So maybe I'll just give one other additional unexpected ally that I have now. And I'll, I'll read from uh, the, the Twitter feed of this, this individual, and then I'll have you guess who it might be. Uh, and, and forgive the partisanship of, of this lady. Um, for, for Mr. Trump, drain, drain the swamp has in practice meant gutting those very sources of independent expertise and analysis on issues from climate change to student loans. This further empowers lobbyists and the already powerful starting a trend started with Newt Gingrich back in the 1990s when he eliminated sources of independent information such as the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Okay, in the middle of this partisan screed, all of a sudden someone is standing up and arguing for something that, as you know, Rush Holt and I have been fighting for for years. We actually now have restored in the House funding to, to restore the House Office of Technology Assessment, which is great. But the person who was tweeting in favor of this um, was Bette Midler. <laughs> okay. And for those of you who have as much little hair as I will remember her, and I guess she is still known. And so this, it's one of the wonderful things about science is that it gets recognized as being valuable by a, a huge range of people. And I, I just want to thank you for being part of that range because it means a lot. And, and things are not as dark as they sometimes seem. Thank you all. Maybe Bette Midler will join us next year. Um, I'd like to now invite New York Congressman Paul Tonko to the stage. He's a former engineer who serves on the committees for science, natural resources, and energy, and co-chairs the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Congressman Tonko, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for your kind invitation to join you again this year. We enjoyed this ceremony, which uh, recognizes immense intellect and uh, passion that makes a difference in our world. So thank you, everyone, for participating as scientists or those who support science. Thank you for gathering here. And thank you to AAAS and, in particular, your CEO, the Honorable Rush Holt, for the leadership in carrying us uh, on a mission that is so very valuable to our growth as an economy, our growth as a nation, and our ability to compete and compete effectively in a global economy. Um, I stand before you, again, old enough to know Bette Midler and older, perhaps, but uh, I was inspired to enter into engineering and brought into politics by the global race on space and the aspirational politics of the 60s. Uh, and for that matter, the late 50s was about making certain that we would regain world leadership in the science area and be able to invest and invest wisely. The results, we unlocked untold amount of technology and opportunity in so many sectors of the economy. And it was more than just that step onto the moon, one small step for man, one giant step for my, mankind. It was about making certain that uh, we understood the real measure of success that comes with science. Science to me seeks truth, truth to power. And um, it troubles me today when we see so many rollbacks and cuts and games being played with scientists across the various federal agencies. Uh, it bothers me greatly, and I will continue to call for review, investigation, and a determination to set the record straight and to uh, call for research dollars that may be seeming trite to many. Some of these concepts might even have a, a, a kind of a fanatical label but we know that the matter at hand is something that opens all sorts of opportunity as we push the boundaries of invention and innovation and enable us to have a stronger nation and a better world. Uh, in order to recognize our science, scientists and the scientific community, I've introduced H.R. 1709, which is the Scientific Integrity Act, which will require that we have a standardized process across the board in federal agencies that invest hard-earned federal taxpayer dollars for the purposes of research, and to make certain that that research is not uh, misrepresented, uh, adjusted, altered in any way, buried, hidden, whatever you want to call the dynamics, play straight with science, invest in the research, and let the pure results go forward, and let them influence policy. We should not play politics with science. 
and science gets us where we need to be in an innovation economy. So thank you all for the great work you do. Thank you. And um, thank you. And let me thank my colleagues that are here this evening that uh, are joining in those efforts. And let me thank Emily. Emily has been a key person on our staff. And thank you so much for all the hard work. Thank you, everyone. And on with the show. Thank you, Congressman. Well, now it's my great pleasure to bring Father Goose up here. That's got a certain sound to it. Representative Jim Cooper of Tennessee originated the ideas you've heard of Golden Goose. It's thanks to his vision and persistence that the award is now in its eighth year. It's thanks to him that we're all here. It's thanks to him that we can uh, turn the lights on and, and, and raise the banner for this kind of serendipitous science. So please join me in giving a great, warm welcome to Representative Jim Cooper. Thank you so much, Frank. I don't want to brag, but I'm about to be Grandfather Goose, so that's pretty special. <laughs> and if I may brag again, we've heard some talk about Bette Midler here tonight. I'm the only living politician who's been endorsed by Taylor Swift. So <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, she has 109 million Twitter followers. So, so <laughs> just. Just saying. <laughs> Science is a team sport, and we're honoring tonight some of the most extraordinary individuals who have led teams to incredible discoveries. Just think of one of the awardees having probably saved 50 million lives. Oh my gosh. Is there a greater achievement possible in all of human history than that. Yet these folks are not household names, but they have led discoveries that have literally improved the whole world. And we need more of those. We need a lot more of those. Let me single out a member of my team who actually got the Golden Goose Award started because I'd had the idea actually back when William Proxmire was still a senator, which is forever ago. That's even before Bette Midler. <laughs> and <laughs> But it took Zach Marshall, who's here in the audience tonight, to actually work out the academic politics and the interest group politics, because there, I don't want to shock you, but there is jealousy in the ivory tower sometimes. There are egos that have to, no, I know. <laughs> Heaven forfend, that could not happen. But he was the one who actually got the pieces assembled right, and there was worry from the Ig Nobel Awards up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because they were worried we were horning in on their turf, and, but you can't have too many cheerleaders for science, for real science. I'm so proud of my colleagues here tonight, and you've heard from each one, and some are actually even qualified, an engineer, a PhD. <laughs> I gotta admit, I did not know there was a PhD in swine nutrition, but that sounds like a Washington DC fundraiser to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's some folks who've been at the trough for a long time. And it, it, but this is a special night. This is a fun night. This has sometimes been called the Academy Awards for Scientists. It sounds a whole lot like Hollywood, but you know that if you're in Washington, D.C., we're Hollywood, but for ugly people. So, <laughs> so don't get too big ahead. Your IQ may be through the roof, but what we really care about are your discoveries where you have so much benefited, not only the American taxpayer, who pays some of these bills, but the entire world. You have given us a better future. You give us hope. So remember this, the way we attract more dollars to the cause, this vitally important cause is, tell me a fact and I'll memorize it. Tell me the truth and I may believe, but tell me a story and I will carry it in my heart forever. You're going to hear some of the greatest stories ever told tonight. So let's listen and let's spread the word. Thank you. Well, bravo. 
Bravo, Father Goose. Thank you very, very much. Uh, that is um, passionate and eloquent stuff. So thanks to our bipartisan group of congressional supporters here and uh, for all that you do uh, to promote this wonderful endeavor and cause. I want to now welcome to the stage another great supporter of the Golden Goose Award. Anne Gabriel is the Senior Vice President for Global Strategic Networks at Elsevier. Elsevier is a global information analytics business that has been a benefactor sponsor of, the, of this award for the past five years, helping to make it possible, helping to raise its visibility, and welcome. Thank you very much. Congressman Cooper is a hard act to follow, and I don't know if this is going to be one of the greatest stories ever told. But I do want to thank you all for the honor and privilege of being here, and I'm old enough to know and remember Bette Midler. And I'll just say, I'm with Elsevier in New York, and for those of you who follow New York real estate, her apartment just hit the market for $50 million. <laughs> so if you want to hit her up for some campaign funding or scientific donation, I I'd say she's pretty much in the know. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Elsevier, um, tonight's winners probably know who we are since many of you have published in our journals and we thank you so much for those submissions. We are the world's, um, one of the world's largest publishers of scientific, technological, and medical journals including The Lancet and Cell. We're a provider of analytical tools which was just mentioned. And we're working with government and institutions to um, share our data and track the evolution of advances in science. Um, recently, we partnered with the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence who are using our data to map the evolution of this as a field for the U.S. government. Before I address tonight's award winners, I'd like to thank AAAS for inviting us to speak here today in front of so many distinguished guests. We offer heartfelt thanks to the congresspersons who support science and the citizens who value the positive impact science has had on their lives. And now, on behalf of Elsevier and the other sponsoring organizations, I would like to offer our enthusiastic congratulations to the recipients of this year's Golden Goose Award. In the words of the father of Golden Goose, Congressman Cooper, which he shared earlier today, it's amazing what happens if you're bold. I wrote it down. He's right. Science, particularly breakthrough science, is not without risk. Throughout my 20 years at Elsevier, I've had the opportunity to speak with researchers and university leaders around the world and to serve as publishing director for some of our journals. One theme that I've come across again and again in my conversations with partners in research is that research doesn't always bear fruit, and it's important to recognize the value of so-called failure or negative results. But when it does bear fruit, it's because all the necessary conditions have been met. The soil had been tilled, the seeds sowed, and the storms weathered. In the words of Stanley Cohen, last year's Golden Goose Award winner for his theory on cytokines, people think of scientific discovery as climbing up a telephone pole. You're going to get something at the top. But discovery is actually like a tree. New things keep popping up along the way, and they create branches. You explore the branches, and every once in a while, you find one with fruit, but you don't know in advance which branch it is. It is scientists like yourselves who are drawing attention to the immense benefits of Blue Skies research, or work that is driven not by commercial gain, but by curiosity, and to the importance of continued federal funding, which is vital at a time when the United States government has become the chief patron of this kind of work. To invest in research also requires an investment in trust, to trust in the precedent that these worthy scientific investigators have set for us. Science conducted patiently, persistently, and with the confidence of the institutions that support it will deliver results. I believe that that is what the Golden Goose Award stands for, freedom of inquiry at the cornerstone of science. So thank you to the members of Congress in attendance tonight and to the Golden Goose Award Committee for recognizing the power of curiosity-driven research and of course to all the winners of this year's award whose diligent scholarship is both inspiring other scientists around the world and helping to solve some of the most pressing problems of our time. We look forward to seeing where your work and the work of your protégés leads you next and to supporting you along the journey. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you, Anne. Uh, before we move on to the next part of our celebration and our ceremony here, um, how about a few shout outs? A few shout outs for some previous Golden Goose awardees and any family members of previous winners we have in the audience. I believe we have Stanley Cohen here. Stanley, there's Stanley, 2018 winner for his work on cytokines. Good to see you again. And Don Nichols and Elaine Lamarand, who's the uh, two of our Silence of the Frogs winners from 2017. Are you with? <laughs> Former Golden Goose winners, could you just stand and let us all see you at once and we'll say thanks. Uh, I'd also like to recognize some of the folks in the video you're about to see who are in our audience. Norbert Hirschhorn, David Nalen, Brad Fenwick, and Ona Baer, thanks to you all as well. We're happy to have some other special guests with us. Dr. Franz Cordova, head of the National Science Foundation. Where are you, Dr. Cordova? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Diane Suvain, chair of the National Science Board and to all of the public servants who are here working hard on Capitol Hill, elsewhere in government agencies to support science, please give yourselves a cheer and give them a cheer. Thanks for all you do. So now for a, another part of this annual Golden Goose tradition, a documentary video to help you get to know this year's Golden Goose awardees. A number of organizations helped make making this video possible. I'd like to give particular thanks to the American Society for Engineering, edu for Engineering Education, the American Society for Microbiology, Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and Vanderbilt University for their support. Here's the video. Like the fabled goose that laid the golden egg, federally funded scientific research has yielded extraordinary yet unexpected returns. Out of odd sounding obscure beginnings have come many amazing advances that have improved each of our lives. The Golden Goose Award recognizes the people and the stories behind these unexpected and incredible scientific breakthroughs. And the whole village of Woods Hole is really oriented towards science, and we grew up as kids of scientists. I don't remember the first time I saw a horseshoe crab, but I do know that I called them limulus before I called them horseshoe crabs. <laughs> That's living in a scientific family. My father, he was very enthusiastic about science, and he was known as an educator as much as he was known as a, a researcher. I was studying platelets, and it was early in that period that Dr. Frederick Bang approached my chief and related to him the work he had done in which he demonstrated that bacteria could cause blood coagulation in the horseshoe crab and suggested that if a hematologist joined him at Woods Hole, some interesting results could be obtained. And so in the summer of 1963, I went to the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole to join Dr. Bang's laboratory. I have to emphasize that I had never seen a horseshoe crab in my life. Dr. Bang, without any additional explanation, told me to put my hand in the tank and grab a crab. Our goal was to draw comparisons between the human blood platelet and the blood cell in the horseshoe crab. But when I started to handle the blood of Limulus, it clotted very rapidly, and I was absolutely stumped and stuck. was at that point I realized that I had a very powerful and practical mechanism for detection of bacterial endotoxin.
dad understood exactly what the importance of it was, but I don't think the general scientific community understood the importance of it for a long time. Slowly, the tests became accepted to be reliable and specific for endotoxin. The impact of the limulus test and its ultimate major use in the pharmaceutical industry has been extraordinary and beyond anything I ever considered. It is the gold standard for endotoxin detection throughout the world. The ability to measure in a precise way the amount of endotoxin in things we are exposed to every day has a societal benefit that I think few people recognize. We are where we're at today in large part because of their good work. I think that my work is an excellent example of the importance of conducting and supporting basic biological research, even when there's no obvious practical benefit at the time the studies are started. The history of investigative science indicates that early failure is a common feature of many discoveries which turned out to be very important. How does an animal know self, as opposed to things that are non-self, and react to all the non-self, but not react with something in our own bodies? Well, to start, let's just talk about immunity. For many years, it was believed an animal can produce an immune response to foreign material, but they'll never produce antibodies to themselves. And anything that was contrary to that was treated with a great deal of skepticism. But let me go back to the beginning. My boss and my mentor, Ernest Witebski, was interested in the substances that stimulate immune response, the antigens. All of us believed that autoimmunity could not occur. I made the thyroglobulin and was very disappointed to find out that it elicited antibodies. So that was a real puzzle. How could that happen? So I did it again, I got the same result. Then I had the idea, well, let's look at the thyroid gland. If in fact this is a true autoantibody, it should have some effect. It might do some damage to the thyroid gland. We showed these sections to the professor of surgery, and he looked at this and he said, oh my God, kid, you have made Hashimoto disease. We were able to get serum samples from patients with Hashimoto disease and do the experiment and show that that disease is the result of true autoimmune response, which damages the thyroid. And now we know that autoimmune diseases which we used to think of as very rare, are very, very common. The idea that there is a scientific definition that explains a condition, validates a patient, and validates their experience, and validates their need for treatment, it is truly an empowering thing. If you go back to this big bang moment for autoimmune disease, he discovered a body misfunction, if you will, that no one thought could exist. That's mind-boggling. It did take Noel's genius, but it took Dr. Wittepsi's mentorship to have him understand the value of pursuing the different course. That unbelievable combination is what's resulted in this burgeoning science and a patient community who's beginning to get its needs met. It took me only a couple of months or so to learn how to measure an electric potential across a frog skin in a laboratory in Copenhagen. 
That was the easy part. In 1963, cholera was killing millions of people every year. The scientific goal at that point was not so much to develop a treatment, but just to understand what the mechanism was and to prove or disprove the prevailing theory that it had to do with poisoning of the sodium pump. It's not really a pump, but it's a biological transport mechanism in the human intestine that was able to absorb water and salts and put it back into the general circulation. Normally, the biological membrane was a frog skin. The tricky part was to adapt that system. I developed a method to use plastic tubing for a patient to swallow and to go all the way through the intestinal tract. But how did we know that we were actually getting an accurate measurement? I came across an article measuring the electric potential the same way I was trying to do. And they noticed that if they added a sugar inside the intestine, the electric potential would go way up. Oh, I saw that as a way to see if the system I had developed for the human intestine would work the same way. Well, by golly, it did. We added sugar to the solution, and the electric potential went way up. At that moment, Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn walked into the lab, and he said, well, that's great. If that works, it means that the sodium transport mechanism is working in the patient while the patient is having cholera. In other words, the sodium pump was not poisoned. And it means that we can use this for treatment. We can just have the patient drink a sugar salt solution. Let's do it. A few years later, Dr. David Nalen and Dr. Richard Cash developed a oral solution that could be administered in the rural villages of East Pakistan, and in fact, all around the world and save tens of millions of lives. But it would not have been done unless Sacker had reawakened the flame. The mythology says that there's a eureka moment, the breakthrough comes, and right away we have insulin to cure diabetes. That's not the way it happens. It isn't always a logical step from A to B to C pitfalls occur and things happen that turn everything upside down. I think the lesson here for policymakers is that just trying to understand fundamental mysteries of nature will ultimately translate into important applications. Serendipity is always there. An important part of this story, of course, is the support for this work. Public funding of scientific research is a foundational commitment of the public to the future. Science is everywhere, and we only know an infinitesimal amount. We may be able to identify the beginning, but we don't know where the end point is. The greatest obstacle to federal funding of scientific research is short-sightedness. There is no substitute for the public to be able to put that substantial amount of resources at discovering new things that don't necessarily have a direct path to some product when the research is being done. Indeed, there are many examples of those independent and freewheeling scientists finding very important observations that led to important breakthrough. But today, the environment is totally different. And it's very hard 
to get funding for really original, out-of-the-box research. Science is often full of serendipitous mistakes, but the real genius that those discoveries teach us is that a true scientist will not miss an opportunity to track down a mystery that may have meaning. I certainly never dreamed when we did those first experiments that it would affect medicine generally and affect human health around the world. That only happens because research takes place. How's that for a little inspiration? And so now on we go. Let's bring out our 2019 awardees <clears throat> up and present them with their Golden Goose Awards. First, we invite the co-chairs of the Golden Goose Awards Steering Committee. You've steered pretty well this year. Aaron Heath of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Meredith Asbury of the Association of American Universities to help hand out the awards this evening. So the first, okay, you can applaud them. Your performance has been flawless so far. Uh, the first recipients of the 2019 Golden Goose Award are Dr. Jack Levin <clears throat> and the late Dr. Frederick Bang. In researching the circulatory system of the horseshoe crab, Dr. Bang found an unknown infection, as you've seen, caused uh, the crab's blood to mysteriously clot. Bang collaborated with Dr. Levin, whose experiments revealed this type of toxin called endotoxin to be the culprit. Levin then used horseshoe crab blood to create a new way to screen for bacterial endotoxins. Today, this test, the limulus, uh, say it properly for me. Ambocytes. Yeah, okay, I want to make sure I got it right. Um, is the standard way to screen drugs, injections, and medical devices for endotoxins. So please welcome Jack Levin to the stage, and honored to we're honored to have uh, Fred Bang's children uh, Molly and Axel here to accept the award on his behalf. Come on up. <laughs> the word is amoebocyte. Amoebocyte, that's what I thought. The word is amoebocyte. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Word is amoebocyte, as I was. Thank you. Okay, our second award this year goes to Dr. Noel Rose and the late Dr. Ernest Witebski. Dr. Rose joined Dr. Witebski's lab, as you learned. The goal was to learn more about molecules specific to certain organs of the body. During the course of his experiments involving a substance produced by the thyroid gland, he found the surprising evidence that the body can form an immune response to its own tissues, not just foreign substances, which went against the predominant scientific understanding of the time. Science now recognizes, recognizes scores of autoimmune diseases affecting tens of millions of Americans and many, many millions more around the world. So we welcome Noel Rose to the stage and Dr. Frank Witebski to accept the award on behalf of his father. Our final awardee is Dr. David Sacker. While doing public health research in Bangladesh, 
Dr. Sacker adapted an experimental apparatus that used frog skin to test intestinal activity in cholera patients. His testing, as you saw, disproved the th prevailing theory at the time and was a catalyst for additional testing and clinical trials, which ultimately led to the development of a simple oral solution to treat cholera patients. Sacker's frog skin research and the human clinical trials that followed are credited with saving, as you have heard, upwards of 50 million lives worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Sacker. Thank you both. And now is the time when we get to have a discussion and learn a little bit more, so I get to come sit in the middle of this august group of people and fire away. Um, I do want to start, Dr. Sacker, with, with you, if we could. First of all, um, you look terrific this evening. You're, you told me earlier the uniform is Thank on you. purpose. Why? This work was done while I was in the public health service as a commissioned officer, and I want to call attention to the importance of public health service as one of the seven major uh, United States Uniformed Services. Bravo. I asked you before, when we were chatting a little earlier, how you ended up uh, in the early 1960s, 1963, in a place called Bangladesh. Well, actually, it wasn't called Bangladesh. It wasn't actually then, at the time. Right? It was called East Pakistan. But be that as it may, to understand what sent me so far away from home, you have to understand the historical context of the time. You said 1963. Well, think about 1963, the spring of 63. John F. Kennedy was president. The Peace Corps had just been established. The Ugly American, a critique of American foreign aid processes in the developing world had been published a few years earlier. And the class day speaker at the day of our graduation from Harvard Medical School in 1963 was a Nobel Prize winning parasitologist by the name of Dr. Thomas Weller. Dr. Weller told us graduating students, you know, he said, if every one of the dollars spent in federally sponsored research at the National Institutes of Health and elsewhere, if every dollar worked, we might have the success of extending the average life expectancy in the United States from 68.7 to 69.1. If 10 cents of each dollar, one-tenth of that amount, were spent in the developing world, we would have the potential of increasing life expectancy from age 40 to age 60. And I, I was hooked. This, this was the that time. That resonated with you. It sure did. And I went to my chief of medicine at the time at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, and I said, look, we all have to serve two years in government service. As physicians, we're eligible to draft to age 55. So we're all going to have to spend time in government service. And many of my colleagues are going to the NIH in Bethesda and to the uh, Naval Medical Hospital in uh, Bethesda or to the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, and that's wonderful. But that's not how I want to spend my two years in government service. I want to go to the developing world and save the world because it was such an inspiring time. And uh, that's what I did. My friends at Harvard uh, said, oh, that's great, David. When you come back from East Pakistan, you can treat all of the cholera patients in Boston as though, you know, if it didn't exist in Boston, it didn't exist, it didn't matter. But uh, it mattered. We're glad you went. Why frog skin? Where'd the, talk about the frog skin. Oh, well, the frog skin was the standard method 
for measuring electric potential across a living biologic membrane. Now, why do you want to measure electric potential across a living biologic membrane? Because that's a measure of the act of transport of electrolytes, in particular like sodium and salt, across the membrane. And the prevailing theory of cholera at that time was that somehow the toxin of the cholera bacillus poisoned the sodium transport mechanism, what we called in the, in the documentary the sodium pump, that ability to absorb sodium and salt and water out of the intestine and to put it back into the circulation where it belongs. And the theory was that because the intestinal cell poisoned and paralyzed by the, uh, by the cholera toxin, because it couldn't absorb the sodium, the sodium in the water would come out as diarrhea and rob the patient of uh, life-sustaining fluid in the circulation. And when I arrived in Dhaka, the, um, the director of the clinical center of the NIH, Bob Gordon, happened to be there at the time. And he said, you know, if that theory is true, if the sodium pump doesn't work, then there ought to be a difference, some change, some abnormality in the electric potential inside the intestinal lumen, inside the, the intestinal cavity. He said, why don't you, David, why don't you go and figure out a way to measure the electric potential in the human intestine? And at that moment, the director of the laboratory, Naval Captain Robert Phillips, said, I have a friend in Copenhagen by the name of Professor Hans Using. And Hans Using was a world-class physiologist who had invented something called the oozing chamber, which was a chamber in a laboratory that suspended a frog skin between two solutions. And you could put electrodes on either side, and you could measure transport of sodium and other substances across the membrane by measuring the electric potential. So that was the standard method. So they arranged to send me to Copenhagen along with my wife and my then 10-month-old 10, 10 baby, who is in the audience. He's 55 now. He's not 10 months old anymore. We, <laughs> Thanks, we Dad. To, <laughs> we went to go. I, I didn't get any older, but, but he did. <laughs> and the, um, I spent a couple of months there, learned how to measure electric potential across a frog skin. And then, as I said, that was the easy part. Then we had to figure out how to adapt it to a human intestine. But the place we began was with a frog skin. And if I could just take one moment uh, to take exception to the term we've heard from you and others so often, Frank, serendipity. It wasn't really serendipitous. It, we didn't really sort of stumble by accident on this discovery. We knew what we were doing. We knew, <laughs> we knew that we were trying to find out what was going on in the intestine of cholera patients to cause them to lose all the fluid. Yeah. And we figured that the way to, we figured that, no, I said so. I, <laughs> that's not my hearing aid. No, I think you're just a little bit. <laughs> we wanted to figure out, so that was the purpose. But in order to test the system, we added the sugar, found that the sugar stimulated the electric potential, we knew that that meant that it was stimulating sodium absorption, but it was Bert Hirschhorn sitting over there who figured out that that could be therapy and pushed to get us to test it. And it was then a year or two later that David Nalen and his colleague also sitting over there figured out that if sugar could enhance fluid absorption in a metabolic ward in the hospital, it could do the same thing in rural villages all over the world. With unbelievable, and it did. unbelievable result, an unbelievable result. Uh, Dr. Watebski, let's talk uh, to you for a moment uh, as we turn to autoimmunity. Um, but tell us a little bit about your, your father, um, who uh, left Nazi Germany and came to this country and forged a new career and, and that story. 
Well, Dr. Rose can tell you much more in detail and in depth about the actual work that my father did uh, than I could possibly do. But um, the reason he left Germany, uh, well, he essentially carried the reason in his wallet. It was uh, a little cutout from a, a paper uh, at the, in Heidelberg. And he was, a, uh, I think, an assistant professor at that point uh, at the University of Heidelberg. And the paper, uh, the little clipping, essentially said, isn't it terrible that we have these Jews on the faculty? And listed a few, including my father. Uh, that was enough uh, for him. Uh, and he first I went to Switzerland. I believe he actually became a Swiss citizen. And then uh, soon thereafter, he came to this country, which I think in his view at that point was at least a relatively safe, tolerant, a uh, place and a beacon of hope and opportunity. And he spent the rest of his life here. First, he was in New York City for a few years, and then in the 1930s, came to the University of Buffalo, and that's where he spent the rest of his life. Um, he never got over the effects of uh, what happened in Germany. And in a way, it was, I think, even worse for my mother. Uh, they met in Germany and got married eventually over here. As I remember, she happened to be on duty. Uh, she was essentially a medical technician, but that was a much broader field uh, those days than it is here. And I think she was on duty on Kristallnacht uh, mm -hmm. at the hospital where she was working. And she essentially refused ever to go back to Germany again. Was even reluctant to speak German, although she was really good in languages. Was your father always, as your memory, the researcher, the scientist, the, the curious <laughs> digger? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think his idea of a good vacation was to go back to the lab. Um, <laughs> I, that was really uh, his life. I remember one or two vacations we had. And, what I most remember is that I think almost every day he was on the phone back to the lab uh, to see what was going on. It was really uh, his life. Where the particular interest came from, I must say I have no idea. I was always a little puzzled. Uh, in those days, to do what he did, you had to be both a bacteriologist and an immunologist, essentially. They were, it was called a serologist, I think, mostly then. Um, I think he hated bacteria, which is one reason why he was probably a pretty good bacteriologist, but his heart uh, was really in immunology. Dr. Rose, when you joined Dr. Witebski's lab, you were working off of a cancer grant, as I understand it, hoping to figure out the biologic mechanisms uh, of the molecules that characterize our different organs, and that maybe those organ-specific antigens might be used to screen for certain cancers. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what you and Dr. Wutebski did or didn't know at the time, um, and the idea um, called horror autotoxicus. Horror autotoxicus, all right, so that's a good place to start. So horror autotoxicus, fear of self-poisoning, is a uh, Latin phrase, if you remember your Latin, Daily. Uh, meaning fear of self-poisoning, and that came from this notion that uh, the um, immune system cannot attack the host, cannot attack itself, which is very logical. I mean, why would you? <laughs> would seem pretty stupid. <laughs> and often in medicine, we, we take things at face value because they're so logical. We really don't need any evidence for it or even any rational understanding as to how it could happen. And that's really where the story resides because this pronouncement, which was given by a, uh, a very famous, perhaps the most famous immunologist, Paul Ehrlich, uh, who was the teacher of the teacher of Ernest Witebsky. And I'm the student of Ernest Witebsky, so I'm following that 
long tradition. And, um, and we, we all sincerely believed horror or the toxicus. Uh, the reason that Witebski was, was particularly famous at that moment, and, and, and Frank, uh, I think, remember this, is that uh, among the other discoveries he made, he was the person who isolated the blood group A substance and the blood group B substance, the thing that makes, I don't know whether you're an A or a B, you look like a blood group A to me, but uh, you may be a B. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm an A and you're an A, then I can give you my blood and so forth. But if you're a B and I'm an A, then that wouldn't work. So go. right, right. And so we we knew that the immune system responded to things that are not self, but it responded to all that was not self because the purpose of the immune system, as we understand it, is to provide protection. Right. And there are always new organisms coming every day. There's a new virus, we're coming on a new uh, flu season, and the immune system has to adapt. And there just aren't any holes in the immune system. Even if something comes from Mars, I can assure you that you can, the immune system will recognize you it. promise. Right. Okay. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so if you think about it, how could the immune system recognize everything else in the universe except yourself? I mean, what would be the possible mechanism for doing that? And that was really the question that I fell into, if you would, in working in, in Witebski's laboratory. Witebski uh, and all my teachers said, horror or toxicus, you've got to learn it. It's true. It's, it, it's, it's part of nature. It's very logical, of course. And being maybe a little rebellious at that point, a little skeptical at that point, I began to work with this strange thyroid protein, thyroglobulin, and I found, in fact, that, that the thyroglobulins were very much the same, not only in, in humans, but also in all other animals we studied. They're very much the same, and we thought, Joe, how can, how can the, in this case, a rabbit, but it might have been me or it might have been you, would recognize all these other protein molecules, but never the thyroglobulin of ourselves. And Horotoxicus told me that it won't do it, and I think maybe I'll test it one of these days. And by golly, I did. I tested it. And the answer is, in this case, the rabbit responded to its own thyroglobulin, violating the precept that I had been taught and um, not only did it respond immunologically, it destroyed the target organ, the organ in which thyroglobulin is found, and created the disease that we call Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So now that was the, the first case of what we call an autoimmune disease, a disease that's, that is caused by a, a, a crazy, out of, out of law immune system the autoimmune disorders in ourselves, wow. and and you and you ran into some massive skepticism. You did had to do this a few times. A few times, again, fact, again. He said, "Repeat it, <laughs> repeat it." You you must have made a mistake. That's that's what we're celebrating. And, and fast forward to today, all that we know about autoimmune diseases today, and how prevalent they are, and what we do with them. Well, the autoimmune diseases, plural, there are many diseases that are caused by autoimmunity. Autoimmunity actually can cause disease in virtually any organ of the body. So every medical specialty has an autoimmune disease of itself. So they have uh, diseases of the brain, like multiple sclerosis, or diseases of the, of the uh, kidney, like lupus, or, or diseases of the intestine, and on and on and on. I, I'm sure you, you, I would predict every, you know three or four people with an autoimmune disease. Several. Hopefully you don't have one, but we'll never get one. But they're very common. The, the number is probably 20 million plus or minus uh, 10, because these are not exact figures. So we're talking about diseases that are very, very common. And uh, I've, I've spent most of my life trying to see what the root causes are by looking at all of the autoimmune diseases. Most autoimmune diseases are treated and studied by physicians who are just interested in one disease. 
That's their specialty, and that's as it should be, because they're the experts in treating multiple sclerosis. They know more than I would know. I couldn't, I'm a physician, but I couldn't treat a patient with multiple sclerosis. But I could do research on multiple sclerosis, and I could disease on other diseases, and look for the common threads that unite them, because I said, that's where the roots are. I'm, I'm not so interested in the stem not your stem, but the stem of the, uh, of the plant or of the, of, the, uh, of the weed, but I'm interested in really what the causes are because I think the, the way to contend with autoimmune diseases um, is uh, not to rely on treatment. Treatment is lifelong, it's very expensive, it's very, very difficult, very tricky, uh, but to prevent the autoimmune diseases. And so that's been my lifelong dream to find ways of preventing them from starting at the beginning. Let's turn to Molly and Axel, children of Dr. Fred Bang, the horseshoe crab family here. <laughs> Axel, you talk in the video about growing up in a scientific family. It's pretty impressive. You knew the Latin term before you knew anything else. Tell us a little bit about your dad. About my dad. Well, he was a, a very disciplined person. I'm hearing an echo. Oh. It's okay. okay. He was a very disciplined person. Um, he focused on science 24-7. 24-7. It was very hard to have a conversation with him without the last phrase being to, something to do, an analogy to science. Or so it was never past the salt, past right. the sodium, right? Right. And, and <laughs> no, no. Um, but uh, I think we had a pretty normal family, except every once in a while you would, you would um, realize when you went to the refrigerator to get a glass of milk, that there would be three jars, uh, you know, see-through glass jars with, with uh, birds' uh, beaks in there, <laughs> from, soaked in formaldehyde. Because oh, good. My mother was also a researcher. So, oh, good. So you want to make sure special. the light was on in yeah. the refrigerator when you reached. So it in was hard to tell a story like that to you know, you know, at the dinner table. Wow. Uh, and he encouraged science discussions and you to experiment when you were kids and on into your well, lives? Well, I think Molly, my sister, and my other sister, Caroline, um, got the, uh, the, the science bug a little more than I did. You know, I was more interested in literature, but I, I liked living there and uh, made some friends. Molly, uh, you're a children's book author and illustrator, and on your website we found a quote that stood out about growing up in Woods Hole. You said, the children learn to love the land and sea and mostly to avoid science, not realizing that science had infected us even as we rebelled against it. Yes, it's really true. We, most of the kids come back to Woods Hole. They grew up there uh, and they love, they want their kids to go to the Woods Hole Science School. They want their kids to know science, but what we grew up with was thinking that we knew science because we'd gone to science school and we, we knew what a limulus was instead of a horseshoe crab, but we don't have a, systemic, a systematic understanding of science, and that makes all the difference. So I know and I'm fascinated by individual facts here and there, but I don't have a systematic understanding of how to tie them all together. Mm -hmm. and one of the things, there were, there were a couple of things that were mentioned before that I wanted to say a little bit about, had Dad thought about. One is that he was a pathobiologist. And so he wasn't a pathologist. What he was interested in was defense mechanisms of any animal. So he wanted to study not only, it wasn't only Limulus that he studied. He studied, he studied sepunculate worms to try to figure out how the sepunculated worm could defend itself against invaders, because it had, it had nothing but little urn cells were floating all around it, and that if something came into the urn cells, I mean, came into the salomic cavity, the, uh, the outside of the gut, then it would form these long, 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 long tails of mucus. And when Axel was talking about supper time and discussions <laughs> at supper, you were asking about that, you'd always know that the end of supper was coming when we started talking about mucus. Okay, that would work well in my house. I, I, I understand why you're both so thin. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, 
my, my, my father had, a diffi had difficulty getting the sepunculus across customs. Because <laughs> most of the sepunculus were from France, and he did the experiments over there, and then he wanted to bring the experimentation to the States, and there, there were some rolling eyes when he got to the customs. Yeah, I bet there, I bet there were some rolling eyes. I would have been there, interested in hearing his explanation at the time, too. So now I have to start with a question that, that I didn't plan on asking until I saw the video here. Um, there's an edit right after you say you joined him in the lab and he told you to put your hand in and grab a crab. What happened? <laughs> well, firstly, the tiny crab that you saw doesn't do justice to the large foot or foot and a half cross cra crabs which were in the sea table in the lab. Uh, I had no choice but to put my hand in. Those of you who have seen Limulus but don't know anything about the animal find them very formidable because they have this long telson or tail which people uh, draw parallels to a scorpion, although it's totally harmless. So I have to give myself credit for bravery. And, put it <laughs> <laughs> and everything went just fine. You were not mortally wounded, obviously. Yes, this yes. is a good thing. So he found this mysterious clotting that occurred in the, in the blood of these horseshoe crabs, and um, he put the mystery aside for a decade. He set it to the side. So when did you come into the picture, and how did that come back to the forefront? Well, I think Dr. Bang decided that a hematologist would help him per, uh, pursue this observation, and he contacted my chief at Hopkins at the time, Lockhart Connolly, and they decided that a uh, hematologist could help with this project. I was a research fellow at the time, and it was my good fortune that Dr. Connolly asked me if I'd like to join Dr. Bang, much to everybody's amazement and jealousy because it allowed me to escape a summer in Baltimore, <laughs> which those of you who live in Washington can fully appreciate. And uh, probably the most wise decision I ever made in my professional career was to accept the invitation to join uh, Dr. Bang and Woods Hole. The clotting was caused by something called endotoxin, as we saw in the, in the video and as you've talked about. Could you talk about what that is and, and how harmful, what the effect is on, on humans of that specifically. Well, endotoxin, as its name indicates, is a toxin. It's a component of the cell wall of every gram-negative organism. This is a large category of bacteria, which, as you might get by their names, do not stain with the gram stain. Uh, bacteria that be familiar to you are gram-negative organisms that produce a particularly dangerous form of meningitis that can kill you in 24 hours, and another gram-negative organism with endotoxin, of course, uh, is E. coli, which is the organism that, pe that can kill a few people if they eat undercooked hamburger. So endotoxin is a component of this wide variety of bacteria. It is a toxin. It's it's described as being fever producing, but it also is capable of triggering a, a whole series of defenses in humans and animals, which if sufficiently stimulated can cause diseases of their own. So it is a dangerous material with a lot of biological activity. We have only a couple of minutes left because we're running a little late and we want to let everybody get out and mix and mingle and get on with your lives. But a couple of questions I'd like to address to the, to the group here, which I think are very, very important given this gathering and what we're celebrating. And that is, I'd like to ask you to, to discuss the role that federal funding played in your work. Federal funding was everything. <laughs> that pretty well sums it up. <laughs> The bow tie is not federal funding, so you can't go there. But talk to us about that. <laughs> Everything else is. <laughs> All right. This actually, historically, maybe the oldest one on the stage, is, is a product of World War II. That's when this happened. Because until that time, most research was funded by companies. In Europe, mainly, Germany particularly, the companies were determining what was, was done. And um, government generally was, was involved not at all in research, as our country is a very state, wide, you know, states are very important. Um, but during World War II, the projects like the Manhattan Project were much too big for any company, 
and involved scientists from all disciplines and even from all countries, I might say, and just referring doc to, to the fact that Dr. Witebsky came from Germany, um, so many of the scientists were the gifts of Hitler. Hitler sent us the people to make the atomic bomb. So all of these had together and companies really couldn't do it and we had to invent the, uh, the uh, and now I've forgotten the name of the agency, uh, the World War II, uh, where science was, was uh, housed. Some of you may remember it. Uh, mm, it's not going to be. Uh, uh, David would. Um, we'll think Any of it shout later. shout outs? Yeah, somebody in the audience. Uh, well, well, we'll come to it. Okay, but you know, that was very strong. And, and it was realized that there is a role for the federal government in research independent of what companies, it wasn't to replace companies, it was to add companies and add another dimension of research which had no direct commercial need. If, if, if it's a company, you have to have a, you know, a product right, right, at right. the end. And federal research was the only place where you could do long-term research that would bear fruit of enormous importance but might take months or years or many, many years. And yours was very much a benefactor of that. Was very much a benefactor. We could never have done right. that if it weren't for... I have one thing to say about that, because when Dad understood the results of the t tests, he knew that that was going to make a lot of money. And so he went to the Marine Biological Laboratory where they had done the research and said, you need to patent this because it'll make a lot of money. He said, I don't want the money for myself. I get the money from the federal government and from grants. It should go back to the organizations that enabled us to do this work. That doesn't happen today. Yeah. The MBL did not take the money. Somebody else eventually patented it, but um, that's, that it was, he was doing that just at the turning point. It's, it's, it's really yes. important. Um, last question or two. Uh, you all have had unbelievable careers, and they took these, you know, if it wasn't serendipitous science, certainly <laughs> serendipitous turns, mm -hmm. and we, all of us, are better because of the work that you have done. What is it about science that sustains you over a lifetime, far beyond where most people would work and would, would continue, but you remain so engaged and so inspirational to the rest of us? Well, I, I, I think it's the problems that one identifies as intriguing, and that's very stimulating. Uh, it's hard to describe. You just get very interested and involved in something, and you just want to keep understanding it. Uh, I'd like to divert just a bit, though, because I think perfectly matching these awards was uh, the anecdote which follows. After the first summer at Woods Hole, we were site visited by the Atomic Energy Commission, which was a major source of funding for our division then because it was the Cold War and there was concern about the effects of atomic bombs and radiation on the bone marrow. And we very proudly showed the work I had done at Woods Hole to these site visitors. Uh, a few weeks later, we got the report of the site visitors telling us that there was no purpose in this work and that they were no longer willing to fund the work at Woods Hole. And I think that's the uh, wonderful anecdote that sums up some aspects of what we're talking about uh, today. That, that's, that's one word to describe it, yes. Thank you very much. Do we have the book? It's under your chair. It's under my chair. <laughs> okay. So before we wrap, I always like to have things like this. Molly wrote a book in 1996 <laughs> called oh. Goose. Oh. <laughs> Wanted, so you're a tarot card reader, or you're a, you knew you were going to be here. You want to tell us about this? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> uh, my daughter's Bengali, and she looks different from other white children. And I'd always wanted to tell her how much I loved her being different. And Goose is about a... A uh, goose that lands into a den of woodchucks. <laughs> this is the story of a little goose who had to leave home to discover what no one could teach her. To my goose, 
and all the wild geese who mistakenly believe they are woodchucks. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. <laughs> Before, before we wrap here this evening, I just want to say thanks to um, all who've made this possible, AAAS and the AU, and to all the sponsors and funders and partners and organizations and every single one of you in the room, but mostly, mostly to those of you who have dedicated your lives to discovery, to curiosity, and to making this world a better place through your science and the science you share with the rest of us. Thank you all very much. Congratulations. Have a great day.